1915 a group of elegantly dressed women, clad in expensive clothes, furs and jewels exited chauffeured cars and entered London's posh Selfridges department store, the staff showed them the usual deference extended to upscale customers, and because of the era's prudish mores, allowed them great privacy to try out clothes. It was only after they left that Selfridges discovered that. The women had stolen a fortune's worth of jewels, furs and clothes. They were members of the 40 Elephants, an all-female criminal gang that operated for nearly two centuries. Below are 20 things about them and other lesser-known historic criminal facts. The female gang that operated for nearly two centuries. As a rule of thumb, gangs and gangland activities tend to be overwhelmingly male domains, but like most rules there are exceptions, one such was a female gang known as the 40 Elephants. For nearly two centuries, from the 1700s, throughout the 19th century, and all the way into the 1950s, they held sway over a part of London. Their criminal activities were not limited to their own neighborhood. They operated across the British capital, and eventually their reach extended throughout Britain. They got their moniker because they were based in the Elephant and Castle, an area in London's borough of Southwark whose most famous landmark was a pub, and coaching in that bore that name. The 40 elephants specialized in shoplifting, helped in no small part by the voluminous, multi-layered and complicated clothing worn by women until well into the 20th century. The era's prudish attitudes, which afforded women significant privacy, also made it easier for female shoplifters to escape notice. They nearly bled posh West End stores white with their shoplifting raids, eventually mere rumors of their presence in an upscale neighborhood sufficed to trigger panics among shop owners. They also exacted tribute from smaller gangs that engaged in shoplifting. Those who refused to pony up were beaten, and sometimes kidnapped and tortured until they changed their minds. Although store thefts were a key part of their criminal activities, it was not all that they had in their bag of tricks. A tough girl gang that didn't hesitate to throw down and duke it out with guys. The 40 elephants stole thousands of pounds worth of goods, which was serious money in those days, it was enough to financially support gang members and their male spouses, and allow them to live in relative comfort. They also got into document forgery. That helped in another side hustle, whereby they got hired as housemaids with fake reference letters, then robbed their employers' homes. Another criminal hustle was blackmail, as members seduced men of respectable backgrounds into brief affairs and threatened to ruin their reputations unless they were paid. As evidenced by their willingness to kidnap, torture, and dish out beatings to exact tribute, the 40 elephants were not squeamish when it came to violence, nor did they shy away from a rumble. They were reportedly able to duke it out with an equal number of men, and their toughness earned the respect of male gangsters. In the interwar years, they associated with the all-male elephant and castle gang, a huge collection of burglars, receivers, smash-and-grab artists, and assorted criminal roughnecks that operated in South London. Unlike their often messy male allies, however the 40 elephants were well-organized, disciplined and tightly run, while they stole expensive clothes they never wore them. Instead they distributed them through a network of fences, and to unscrupulous store owners who altered their labels and got fake receipts, often furnished by the 40 elephants to show that they had been legally purchased. That brains before brawn attitude helps explain the 40 elephants' longevity. They lasted for nearly two centuries, while the elephant and castle mob lasted for barely a decade before it was put out of business by rivals. Before a professional police force was created, England had thief takers. Scotland Yard and London Bobbies are well known nowadays, however England did not get around to setting up a professional police force until the 19th century. Before then to bring a criminal to justice was pretty much an ad hoc affair that often relied on private initiative. Into that void a profession of so-called thief takers cropped to partially fill the void, they were private individuals a bit like bounty hunters. However, while bounty hunters were paid by courts to bring in fugitives who skipped their court appearance, thief takers were paid by crime victims to catch criminals or recover stolen property. The most famous thief taker was 18th century master criminal Jonathan Wilde, a man whose career reportedly gave us the term double cross. According to folk etymology, the term double cross, as in deception by double dealing, originated with Wilde. He reportedly kept a ledger in which two crosses were literally placed next to the names of those who ran afoul of him. Wilde also reportedly gave the phrase its figurative meaning when he pretended to have seen the light, given up his criminal ways and gone straight. The Great Double Cross of a Master Criminal Jonathan Wilde was an English master criminal 
who reigned over an underground kingdom of thieves and highwaymen, he ran a far-flung extortion racket, and was Britain's biggest fence for stolen goods. After he declared that he had reformed his ways and gone straight, the authorities turned to Wilde to help bring rampant crime under control. They figured that it literally took a thief to catch another thief, so they hired Wilde and set him loose on criminals, who had seemingly run amok and terrorized London. Designated thief-taker general, he took to his new job and title with a passion, he formed highly effective teams of thief-catchers who fell upon the criminal underworld and criminals with a will. However, there was a hiccup. Wilde hunted only criminals who competed against him. He double-crossed the English authorities, and used their trust in him to turn himself into the greatest English criminal kingpin to have ever lived. Even as he was lauded for his effectiveness as a crime fighter, Wilde ran an extensive underground criminal empire that spanned the realm. The Reformed Master Criminal Who Hoodwinked the Authorities to the authorities' delight, Jonathan Wilde fell upon the criminal underworld like a ton of bricks, he broke up gangs and sent criminals to the gallows by the dozen. During his career as a thief-taker, at least 120 people were executed based on Wilde's testimony, and information that he furnished the authorities. He also set up a side business as a private detective to recover stolen goods for a fee. However, he failed to inform his clients that it was his thieves, who had stolen their goods in the first place, Recovery simply came down to Wilde sifting through his warehouses of stolen property. Wilde had not gone legit, but had simply hoodwinked everybody. The thief-taker general became an even bigger kingpin, and delivered competitors to the authorities simply as a mean to rid himself of rivals, he was finally brought down, when a criminal whom Wilde had double-crossed turned around, and accused the thief-taker general of fencing stolen goods. An investigation confirmed the allegation, and Wilde was arrested. Many of his underlings then turned crown evidence against him, and the fact that England's greatest crime fighter had also been its greatest criminal all along came out. Wilde was swiftly tried, convicted and hanged at Tyburn, where he had sent so many others to their doom. British Bobbies were not always admired. London finally got a professional police force in the 19th century, but it was met with fierce resistance from many, nowadays, London cops the officers of the Metropolitan Police Service, are generally respected and affectionately known as bobbies. That was not always the case. For decades after they were first formed in 1829, the very legitimacy of police and the need for their services was questioned by many Victorians. Naysayers were not limited to the criminal classes. As a result, MPS officers had a fraught relationship with the public they were sworn to serve. Indeed, throughout much of the 19th century, the Bobbies were held in low esteem by much of the public. Early London cops were not only routinely derided and disrespected, but were also frequently actively trolled, baited, and attacked for kicks and giggles. Many people seriously disliked the cops, and there was an active anti-police ideology in the Victorian era, communicated through a radical press, that depicted the new police as an unconstitutional infringement upon English liberties. The Bobbies were often referred to as blue locusts and blue idlers. It reflected a perception that police were parasites who were excused by their position from honest work, and who unfairly got to live off the taxes of honest men. Victorian cops who tried to arrest criminal miscreants were often attacked by Londoners. Early Victorian cops were especially disliked by the lower classes, who resented the suppression of popular recreations, and customs such as public drinking, gambling, prize fights and street games, routine police work in poorer neighborhoods such as patrols to keep an eye out for trouble, raised hackles. It was often viewed as an intrusive and unprecedented surveillance regime. Accordingly, many Victorians developed an active antipathy towards police, and did what they could to make the life of beat cops as miserable as possible. That often took the form of varied degrees of harassment, or even violence. Police who tried to arrest criminal miscreants, particularly in lower-class neighborhoods, were often set upon and attacked by the arrestee's neighbors, friends and passers-by in order to rescue him from the cops' clutches. In addition to objections to police interference with street life, there was even greater resentment when the police got involved in domestic affairs and affrays. Cops who approached private residences, regardless of the motive, risked a hostile reception. Victorians liked to attack cops for fun. For Victorian cops to even simply knock on doors to alert residents to security lapses, such as a door or window left open at night, was a fraught affair. It was often met not with gratitude, but with abuse and violence from citizens who assailed the police for their temerity and disturbance of their peace. The Bobbies were especially reluctant to get involved in instances of domestic violence. 
from bitter experience, they feared to encounter the wrath of both parties, who often temporarily forgot their own squabble and united in order to attack the cops. Sometimes the violence was not instrumental, such as attempts to free somebody known to the assailants from the police, but was instead visited upon the bobbies for the sheer fun of it. Many liked to lead policemen on merry chases, while others simply attacked them out of the blue. More creative were some gangs of lower-class youths, who often collaborated to set up ambushes for the police, and baited the cops to chase them down alleys, and footpaths strung with trip wires. The wires release would spring traps straight out of Looney Tunes that caused bricks to smash into the policemen, or tipped buckets of refuse to fall upon their heads. The Italian-American Mafia was not born where most people assume. In pop culture depictions, the Italian-American Mafia is most often associated with New York City and its vicinity. Many people take it for granted that the mob must have its roots in the Big Apple, home of the five great crime families, the Godfather and the melting pot extraordinaire. Indeed, NYC was the first destination of millions of Italian immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, who disembarked and were processed into the U.S. at nearby Ellis Island. However, what would become the American Mafia emerged first not in New York, or even the next city most commonly associated with mob lore, Chicago. Instead that criminal association was born much further south, deep in the heart of Dixie, in New Orleans. In 1869 the New Orleans Times reported that the city's 2nd district was overrun with well-known and notorious Sicilian murderers, counterfeiters and burglars who in the last month have formed a sort of general co-partnership or stock company for the plunder and disturbance of the city. The 19th century criminal factions that fought America's first mob war. The favored destination of southern Italian immigrants in the 19th and early 20th centuries was not the United States, but Argentina and Brazil, those countries' Latin culture, Romance languages, Catholic religion and warmer climes, were more hospitable and more easily adapted to than America. New Orleans became a secondary destination in the 19th century because of its extensive traffic with those southern locales. As with all waves of immigrants the new arrivals brought with them their baggage, both literal and figurative. By the 1870s, Sicilian immigrants Carlo and Alberta Matronga had established the Matronga crime family in New Orleans, which operated out of a salon and brothel. The Matrangas expanded their criminal activities from prostitution to labor rackets and a lucrative extortion scheme known as the Black Hand. They collected tribute from Italian laborers, as well as from a rival Italian crime family, the Prozanzanos who monopolized South American fruit shipments. In the 1880s, America witnessed its first mob war, when the Matrangas fought the Prozanzanos over control of the New Orleans waterfront, things steadily escalated, as each family brought in more, and more muscle in the form of mafiosi from the old country. A mass lynching that helped establish a key mob rule. As the gang war between the Matrangas and Prozanzanos heated up, the violence spilled over, that put pressure on New Orleans authorities to act, so the police chief launched an investigation. For his troubles, he was assassinated in 1890. Unable to identify his killers, he stated the Dagos shot me, just before he died. The result was a fierce backlash, and 19 New Orleans mafiosi were arrested and prosecuted. In a first trial of nine of them, the criminal defendants successfully tampered with the jury. Despite mountains of evidence against them, six were acquitted outright, while the other three had hung juries. The next day, March 14, 1891, a mob of thousands, whose numbers included some of New Orleans' most prominent citizens, stormed and broke into the prison that housed the defendants. They dragged out and lynched 11 of them, the biggest single mass lynching, as opposed to massacre there are specific terms for different types of atrocities, in U.S. history, that had a salutary effect on the mafia. It demonstrated that America differed from Sicily and southern Italy, where criminals could act in brazen defiance of the authorities and society, with little to fear from either. In the U.S., there are limits to what criminals could get away with. From then on, the Italian-American Mafia adopted strict rules against the targeting of law enforcement and rigorously enforced them. As seen below, the Mafia did not hesitate to preemptively kill major mobsters who sought to go after cops and prosecutors, and thus threatened to bring down unwanted heat upon their criminal operations. The Mafia whacked this criminal boss before he could whack another. The early 1930s witnessed a massive gangland conflict known as the Castle Ameris War that severely disrupted the American mob's businesses, 
the conflict finally ended after young mafiosi Charles Lucky Luciano engineered the deaths of the rival faction's bosses, Joe Maseria and Salvatore Maranzano. Luciano then set up a cooperative entity, the Commission, to run the Italian America Mafia and arbitrate its disputes. To give the Commission teeth, Luciano set up a streamlined contract killing organization that came to be known as Murder Incorporated. Headed by Louis Lepke Buckhalter, Murder Incorporated acted as the muscle and enforcers of the Mafia's higher ups. In theory, mob killings had to be pre approved by the Commission, who would then direct Murder Incorporated to carry out the murders. Their most famous victim was Dutch Schultz. Schultz was a close friend of many mob higher ups, including Lucky Luciano. Such friendships did not protect him when he threatened to become a loose cannon after crusading prosecutor Thomas Dewey put him in his crosshairs. Schultz sought permission from the commission to kill Dewey, but was turned down, as seen above, ever since the 1891 New Orleans mass lynchings. The Italian-American mafia prohibited the targeting of law enforcement. When Schultz indicated that he might go rogue and kill Dewey anyhow, the commission ordered his death, before he invited a catastrophic backlash upon all with a hit on the prominent prosecutor. Three murder incorporated hitmen tracked Schultz down to the Palace Chop restaurant in Newark, New Jersey, where they executed him, his accountant and two bodyguards. When Mussolini put the mafia out of business in Italy. In 1919, the 18th Amendment was ratified, and prohibition of the manufacture, transport and sale of alcohol throughout America went into effect a year later, one of its unintended and unforeseen consequences was to boost organized crime throughout the U.S. In effect, prohibition took what had been a huge legal and taxed industry and gifted it to the criminal classes. The result was a business boom for organized crime in the U.S. in general, and the Italian-American mafia in particular, which was better positioned than any other criminal group, to take advantage of the new opportunities presented. However, just as fate handed the Italian mob a precious gift in the new world, it dealt it a severe blow back in the old country, Benito Mussolini and his fascists came to power in Italy, around the time that prohibition went into effect in the US. No Italian government before had managed to keep the Sicilian Mafia and the Camorra in check, nor has any Italian government since. As seen below, Mussolini crushed them. Farcical buffoon he might have been, but the Italian dictator did manage to successfully suppress the Mafia and organize crime in Italy. The Mafia in Italy was dead, until the U.S. military brought it back to life. The Sicilian Mafia and Camorra throve and still do, in Italy's corrupt political culture. Key to their success is their ability to work the system and master its intricacies. They use bribes and threats to subvert politicians, police, and judges and vent them to their will until organized crime became a state within the state. The fascists were not ones to share power or tolerate challenges, however Mussolini was neither concerned with nor constrained by legalities, in his dealings with the Mafia and Camorra. The dictator simply bypassed the criminal justice system, and sent in the army and black shirts to round up mafiosi en masse, and kill any who resisted. For over a century, the Mafia had intimidated civilians, and its members openly strutted as scary tough guys. They discovered that soldiers were scarier and tougher. Luckily for the American Mafia, Mussolini's crackdown in Italy forced Italian mafiosi to flee the old country. The push factor at home coincided with a pull factor in the U.S., where Italian crime families experienced an unprecedented business boom because of prohibition. The mafiosi who fled Italy swelled the ranks of the mob in America just when their services were most needed. It was not until World War II and the Allied invasions of Sicily and Italy that the Camorra and Sicilian Mafia were reborn when the U.S. Army made use of their remnants to help administer the occupation. It was wartime, and the exigencies thereof called for the use of whatever and whoever was at hand to help win and save American lives. After what Mussolini had done to them, the mafiosi were committed anti fascists and quite eager to help the enemies of Il Duce. The Godfather of Harlem. Interest in Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson has seen a revival after the TV series Godfather of Harlem was released, with Forrest Whitaker in the role of Johnson, from the early 1930s until his death in 1968. The real life Bumpy Johnson was Harlem's most feared criminal and crime boss. Born in South Carolina in 1905, he got his nickname from a bump in the back of his head. When he was 10 years old, Bumpy's older brother killed a white man and fled to the north to escape a lynch mob. Bumpy's temper and refusal to abide by the day's racial codes, particularly the deference to White's part, 
stood out and alarmed his parents, they feared that he would follow in his older brother's footsteps, and kill somebody, or get lynched. So when he turned 14, Bumpy was sent to live with a sister in Harlem. There he joined a protection racket that shook down local stores. Eventually Bumpy got his big break, when he was hired as a leg breaker by Madame St. Clair, a time Harlem's biggest bookmaker and crime queen. Harlem's most feared and revered criminal. Bumpy Johnson eventually became a numbers runner for Madame St. Clair, then a bookmaker. When mobster Dutch Schultz tried to take over St. Clair's bookie operations in the early 1930s, Bumpy was her point man in a vicious gang war. It lasted until Schultz's assassination on mob boss Lucky Luciano's orders in 1935, described in a previous entry above. After Schultz's demise, Bumpy negotiated a deal with Luciano in the 1930s, by which Harlem bookmakers retained their independence in exchange for a cut to the mafia. It was the first time that a black man had struck such a deal with the Italian mob, and it made Bumpy Johnson a respected and somewhat heroic figure in the neighborhood. Thereafter, he was the main associate of the Luciano later Genovese crime family in Harlem. Bumpy was a criminal both feared and revered for decades. He became friends with famous figures such as Cab Calloway, Billy Holiday Sugar Ray Robinson, and Lena Horne. His activities were reported in the celebrity sections of magazines such as Jet. Bumpy Johnson was little known until recently. Bumpy Johnson became Harlem's criminal kingpin, and every hood needed his approval in order to operate in that part of town. He was known to be well-read, a trait that earned him another nickname, the Professor. He did nine years in Alcatraz from 1954 to 1963, and was greeted with a parade upon his return. Yet despite his flashy fashion, his poetic pretensions and ostentatious distribution of turkeys to the poor on Thanksgiving, Bumpy never joined the pantheon of famous American villains. Indeed, he was largely unknown until the recent release of the TV series Godfather of Harlem, that was despite the fact that the stock gangster boss character in every black exploitation film, starting with Bumpy Jonas in Shaft, is modeled on Bumpy Johnson, and despite the fact that the entire gangster rap genre is essentially a homage to Bumpy. He almost certainly murdered and ordered the murder of more people than, say John Gotti, Jesse James, Billy the Kid, and perhaps even Al Capone. He certainly ran his criminal empire for far longer than any of them ran theirs, the criminal kingpin who kept order in the streets of Harlem. One reason why Bumpy Johnson was not as well known as other iconic American criminal figures is that he was black, and so were most of his victims, his exploits did not resonate far beyond Harlem. Another factor is that there was something cold and reptilian about him. Most famous criminals were hot and passionate. Bumpy Johnson, by contrast, quietly made his victims disappear in that he was like Al Capone's successor Frank Nitti, another crime boss who ran his criminal kingdom for decades, attracted little public attention throughout, and died of natural causes while free. Bumpy Johnson died of a heart attack in a Harlem restaurant around 2 a.m. on the morning of July 7, 1968, when he clutched his chest and keeled over. His death was dramatized in the movie American Gangster, in which he expired in the arms of his surrogate son and successor. Frank Lucas who went on to revolutionize New York's drug trade. Bumpy Johnson had dominated Harlem's criminal scene for decades, and maintained some measure of order on the streets, after his death, various contenders scrambled to fill his shoes. Their competition, and a desire to control it and keep things from getting out of hand, led to the rise of what came to be known as the Black Mafia, until that eventually fractured and chaos reigned. The criminal who went after England's crown jewels, Colonel Thomas Blood was an Anglo-Irish officer from County Clare, who gained a reputation as one of England's most audacious rogues. Among his deeds or misdeeds were his attempts to kidnap, and when that did not work out too well to kill, the governor of Ireland. He is best known however for a criminal exploit, that made him famous as the man who stole the crown jewels. There was little in his background to indicate his turn to crime. The son of a prosperous blacksmith, the future Colonel Blood came from a good family, Indeed his grandfather lived in a castle, and was a member of Parliament. Blood's career as a rogue started with the English Civil War, when he left Ireland for England in 1642, to fight for King Charles I. However when it became clear that the Royalists were bound to lose, Blood abandoned Charles and switched to the King's parliamentarian enemies. He was well rewarded but only for a while. Colonel Blood's Beef with the Monarchy 
King Charles I lost the English Civil War, and after he repeatedly betrayed the parliamentarians, who sought a constitutional solution, he was tried and beheaded. The monarchy was abolished, and England became a commonwealth and a protectorate ruled by Oliver Cromwell. In the new regime, Colonel Thomas Blood was rewarded for turning coat with a big estate, and was made a justice of the peace. He prospered, but in 1660 the monarchy was restored, and Charles I's son assumed the crown as King Charles II. Blood lost all his lands, and in fear of reprisals fled back to Ireland with his family. He was understandably unhappy with his reversal of fortunes, and became an avowed enemy of the monarchy. In a bid to retaliate and recoup his losses while at it, Blood plotted to kidnap James Butler, 1st Duke of Ormond and Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, and hold him for ransom. However the plot failed. Blood's brother a co-conspirator was captured and executed for treason, while Blood fled to Holland with a price on his head. He returned in 1670 and hatched yet another plot to kidnap or kill Ireland's lieutenant governor, which also failed. At that point, desperately short of funds, Blood decided to become a criminal and go for a huge score. He would steal the crown jewels of England. 